So we're going to begin with Craig White. The topic, patch multiple rows in power apps like a Jedi. <sighs> Craig, the floor is yours. Thank you for the Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Cool. Actually, your mic's cutting out a little bit. Say, say that again. Okay. Can you hear us better now? Yeah, yeah. That's better now. All right. Cool. Fingers crossed everything works as expected. Okay. Hope you can see my screen. We're going to talk today about patching multiple rows in power apps. This is quite a common requirement, something I've built for many, many times over the years. So I'm going to show you three really, really awesome techniques to do it today. Uh, just to kind of do a quick introduction, if you don't know who I am, I'm Craig. I'm a Power Platform Architect. I work for ANS in the UK, so I get the joy of working with Mr. Huntingford on most days, which is absolutely epic. I've been quite active in the community this year over my blog and the forums and a few other bits and bobs. Uh, when I'm not working, when I'm not doing the community stuff, um, I'm taking silly pictures with my little one and I'm building very expensive Lego sets if you've not already gathered from my background. Cool. So what our scenario is today is we've got 100 questions and we want our users to uh, give us responses to each of those questions and then we're going to save those, those responses back to a data set uh, to a data source we're going to use dataverse for this one but essentially you can use sharepoint sql the techniques are exactly the same we've generated a sample of 100 rows um, and just as a quick tip if you ever want to generate some quick fire data in your apps to kind of play around with um, i tend to use a sequence function so i'm using sequence 100 because 100 rows of data and then for all of those, I'm just going to add them to a collection and just map uh, an ID field and a couple of text fields, just so I've got a collection to play with. So these 100 rows are what we're going to be playing around with today. Before we get into the really good methods, I just wanted to highlight one of the perhaps the not so good methods. And the reason why I mentioned that is because this is probably one of the most common methods we see across uh, the forums and various chats. And that method is using for all, and within that for all, using the patch function. Now, this is probably quite good if you've got a couple of rows to manage, but if you've got lots of rows to manage, such as 100, this can take quite uh, a lot of time. It's quite an expensive operation because essentially for every row in that collection, we are going to patch our data source and make a new row each time. And the easiest way to see this in action is to look at the behavior. So let's run that initial uh, bit of code. And we can see that that for rule and patch is creating a new row each time. We can see the numbers are slowly going up because it's iterating through as a loop. And if we've got lots of information, is that the best user experience? Well, maybe not. That took 14 seconds to put that payload back to our Dataverse table. That might not be great. And again, you could probably use this methodology for a couple of rows, but if you want to scale your data up in future iterations of your app, you want to make sure it's performing. So how can we get that? 14 seconds down to something a bit more sensible. Let's have a look at technique number one. And this one is very, very simple. All we're going to do is swap around the patch and the for all. For all is used quite a lot in a, a loop iteration, like we've just done with that previous example. But we can actually use for all to build a table of data that we want to process. You'll notice that this time the patch is on the outside, which is our parent object. Therefore, it's going to send that whole payload as a batch rather than doing it one row at a time. Just that little tweak. Let's see how quick that takes. One second. Is that better? I think so, right? 14 seconds down to one second. That's going to be a lot of value for our users to process those um, records in a batch rather than one at a time. So that's method number one. Method number two. Uh, a very common method, I think this has been blocked about quite a few times in the community by lots of different experts uh, who know way more than I do. But essentially, what we're going to do is build a collection that matches the schema of the table that we want to write our information back to. And when they can use a slightly different method of patch that you might be used to, to then process that collection again in a batch. And this is how it works. So firstly, we want to identify the table we want to write our data back to. So this is my Dataverse table, schema match examples. And I want to build an empty collection. I don't want any data in it. I just want to get the schema. There's lots of ways to build an empty collection. Uh, the two that I've most commonly used, either filter by something that never will ever, ever, ever exist in your data source. So you're guaranteed to get that empty structure or use first n and zeroth. 
can you get the zero? Is that a word? I don't know. But essentially, we do not want to get any records. We just want to get the structure. Um, so that's our collection bill. That's what's our replication of, of our table we want to send the data to. We then want to take our sample data in my scenario and map that to that collection that we've just built. Um, and again, we could just iterate through those 100 rows and just add that to that collection that we've just built. Now, bear in mind, if you're doing some schema matching and your source table has complex columns such as yes, no, lookups, choice columns, if you're mapping your data back to the collection you've just built, you'll need to make sure that your values match the schema and the column types that your data source is going to be expecting to have. Once we've got that all set up and stored, our patch statement is very simply patch the table with the collection that we've just put all of our data in. Now, if you've been patching a few times, or if you're slightly newer to the Power Platform, you might have seen with patch, you'll have to specify defaults to add a new row, or you might need ID equals ID to update existing rows. You'll notice that neither of those are here in this technique. That's because with the schema match, it automatically recognizes new items that need to be created and automatically recognizes existing items that need to be edited, which is really cool. And you can repurpose this bit of code if you want to edit data in the future. So we could build the same collection with a reference that does return some data, make the changes in our collection, and then again, use the same piece of code to patch back those edits in bulk. And again, this is a really, really quick method. If we run the code for that, naught seconds. Again, that's a lot better than the 15 seconds we had right at the beginning. So that's really cool. Two really, really rapid methods. Now, both of those methods you're probably quite familiar with in this kind of structure. I use the best load code tool on the planet to demonstrate this, Microsoft Excel. This is what we're using for this image here, typical rows and columns. Everyone's kind of used that data structure, been using it for years. It's very, 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 very common. What if I told you I could put all 100 rows of those data, of that data, and the four columns in a single cell in a single row? Maybe not so much for, of a common example that people might have been used to. This is not a known as a no SQL approach to data. It's not using relational tables. It's not using relational data, semi or non-structured data. We can basically just put as a massive text object into a multiple line of text column in our data source. So for this, we can effectively use two functions in Power Apps. We can use JSON to convert our rows and columns in our sample data into one big text object. And then we want to bring that data back into our app so we can edit it. We can use the parse JSON function, uh, which went into GA two months ago, I think, which was brilliant for me because I can finally actually use this uh, method with, with some confidence. And I'm sure you can too if you like this method. Let's have a look at the code. Let's see what it looks like. So it's kind of a bit of a hybrid between the schema approach, um, but essentially, what I'm looking at here is to build a collection uh, with one row of data, not 100. And we are effectively taking that collection that we are using for our sample data and converting it to JSON. So it's going to be one big lump of text output. We are using this optional parameter in the JSON function just to format it to make it look a bit nicer. And we'll see that in a minute. And then again, we're going to patch that single row back to our table. And this method, again, is super, super rapid. This is the output here. We've got one row in our data source. This is a multiple line of text column where the JSON saved. And as we can see, we've got all 100 records that's just put right into that single cell in our single row. Lovely job. We want to get that data back into edit. OK, how do we do that? That's where the parse JSON function uh, comes into its own. So a quick run through of that. Um, the parse JSON function essentially is going to iterate over that massive JSON payload we're just stuck in that single cell and rebuild the collection of sample data that we've just been working with. So as an example, that's our single cell. This is our now our typical tabular structure that we're used to. So let's make a couple of edits. So we can go PP, CT demo, um, stick in a couple of emojis. Um, we can obviously see my emoji history, so let's not go there. But let's put in some beer and a rocket. And this button here is going to convert that collection again back to JSON update this existing row on the left and then this constant loop will just keep happening for that 100 rows of data so here we can see that change is now stored as json we can then load that back into our collection and we can continue doing those loops over and over again a really really rapid way to save multiple rows of data 
obviously you might be sitting there thinking again, well, what method do I use now? What's right for me? Um, I won't gloss on this for too long, other than to say that it depends. I'm a typical consultant. Um, but essentially, you need to kind of look at what your requirements are. What's your reporting? Do you need to have relational data or can you work with semi-structured? Storage requirements, obviously, are you looking at line by line or can you store everything in a single row? There's lots of different things that you might need to contemplate before you decide which method to use. But the purpose of today was just to show you three really fast methods that you can potentially use in your existing or your future apps to save multiple records really, really fast from your Power Apps. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you for listening. Um, we, I think we'll drop a link in the chat for a blog and a sample app you can download if you kind of want to digest any of those techniques in your own time. And yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Do we? I mean, I think everybody wants you, Craig. Excellent job. And I love how you're using it all within Power Apps to show Power Apps, right? It's like Appception. So super, super cool. Uh, definitely the force is strong with that app. See you. See you. No, no, no crickets. Thank <music> you.